multi-billion dollar collegiate sports industry. We have to figure out a way to fairly compensate those who are fueling that industry. I think the right thing would be for him to step down, but I don't, I'm not holding my breath for him to do the right thing. I have seen and I have definitely heard enough of Mark Emmert to conclude that he needs to go, not to step down, to be asked to step down. Because to me, he has revealed himself to be more problem than solution for the NCAA. You've been extremely outspoken on the NCAA, saying in part, quote, I think they're just one of the most vicious, most ruthless organizations ever created by mankind. About the NCAA president, Mark Emmert, and whether or not the sharecroppers on his money farm are ever going to be allowed to keep some of the dollar bills they harvest for him. The Capo di Tutti Capi of organized college sports has told a forum in New York that no matter what anybody else thinks, or indeed no matter what everybody else thinks, the NCAA will never let its athletes get paid. Because now on his watch, we have watched the NCAA fumble and stumble through the Cam Newton investigation, the Shabazz Muhammad investigation, the University of Miami debacle of an investigation. And dare I bring up, we have watched the NCAA run completely out of bounds, completely avoiding all due process in the Penn State issue. Since the late 19th century, college football has evolved and expanded at unprecedented rates. It all began on November 6, 1869 in New Brunswick, New Jersey, when the Rutgers Scarlet Knights hosted the Princeton Tigers in the first ever college football game. Rutgers came out on top with the victory, but the result of the game is overshadowed by the impact it had on collegiate football. Soon after, more universities such as Harvard, Yale, and Columbia began gathering teams to compete. In the 1880s, Walter Camp recognized the untapped potential of the game and helped restructure regulations. He implemented the rules that f enforced only 11 members could be on the field at once and also founded the down and distance system. As popularity grew, there were 250 active collegiate teams participating in college football by the turn of the century. However, as the game developed into a more intense sport, notable figures in history began to express concerns with the rapid growth in fan popularity. As a matter of fact, President Theodore Roosevelt was one of the first to openly publicize his trepidations. After a reported 20 deaths from football-sustained injuries in 1905, President Roosevelt demanded changes in the rules to ensure safety of all players. Roosevelt claimed he believes in the tough-minded nature of the game, but refused to continue allowing players to sustain life-threatening injuries. The steps that Roosevelt took towards establishing the National Collegiate Athletic Association, also known as the NCAA, saved the game from extinction at the time. However, today the NCAA is structured with a money-driven mindset. It does not provide for the athletes in the way it should, nor does it make decisions based upon moral ethics. I think revenue has taken away some of the purity, mm -hmm. and, and I think that that's all driven society. Uh, the evolution of college football has led to its development as a crucial component to American culture. There was a time when the game did not hold the attention of most of the country, but those days are long gone. In fact, many statistics indicate that the growth of the game may even result in college football possessing a higher popularity than the National Football League. For example, according to ESPN.com, in 2011 the Dallas Cowboys led the NFL in average attendance, posting nearly 85,512 fans per home game. Meanwhile, in that same year of 2011, Auburn University finished 10th in the NCAA in fan attendance, averaging roughly 86,087 fans per game. Therefore, more fans are fleeing to watch the college game than the NFL games. This increase in popularity causes a higher demand for success because otherwise coaches would could soon be feeling the wrath of fan bases shall they lose. Schools are willing to allow their football programs to dictate the decisions of the university. 
For example, University of Maryland's president, Dr. Wallace D. Lowe, cited the deciding factor to move from the Atlantic Coastal Conference to the Big Ten Conference in the year of 2014 because of revenue it could produce for the football program and the football program only. In essence, the decision to cut ties with the Atlantic Coastal Conference derives from the economic opportunity at hand. Maryland was willing to burn rivalries, burn history, all for the sake of money. The move will allow Maryland to play in a more competitive football conference and consequently recruit more advanced players for the program. Essentially, the decision to switch conferences suggests Maryland cares solely on its football program as opposed to other sports which vowed to maintain the rivalries. For example, the primary incentive for schools such as Boise State located in, in Idaho to join conferences on the opposite side of the coast such as the Big East all funnels to one common pursuit, money. The bottom line is it's money. It's, it's the revenue. I think that people are greedy. I think that, um, I think greed, greed is, is, is the word. Um, uh, years ago when um, Tim Tebow was in the national title, right, for football, played for Florida, and he had a major concussion right before the title game. Do you guys remember that? And I couldn't help but think, as an athletic trainer and as an athletic director, I would not want him to play. Like morally and ethically, he shouldn't have played. If if he didn't play, not only would they have probably lost the game, but it would have cost that university billions, not millions, billions. And so it comes into the fact that, you know, this is a kid that didn't get a paycheck and he sacrificed his physical well-being so that the university could get the money. That's not very fair. You talk about greed at its highest. There's greed. There's no pure purity of sport with that. There's, that's just morally and ethically wrong. Now, I'm not there to examine him and say, hey, you know, he should have played or he shouldn't have played. But from reading whatever, all the research that I read, and it bothered me enough that I read a lot about it, he shouldn't have been on that field. And he kind of got lucky that, that someone didn't hit him hard. Because yeah. it, it, it could have hurt him. Yeah. You know? So I look at that and I think that here we are, in this point in time in, in sports world, and we know how important concussions are, and we know what could happen to us, and yet there you go, because money overruled morality and ethics. Interestingly enough, in 1999, Louisiana State University President Mark Emmert declared that, quote, the critical role of the football program is clear. It is of vital importance to the entire LSU community, the students, the fans, the alumni worldwide, and the state of Louisiana. Simply put, success in LSU football is essential for the success of Louisiana State University. End quote. Today, Emmert is the president of the NCAA. Thus, it is unfathomable that a president overseeing the, this growing issue is one of the roots of the problem. By allowing a man who views a football team as greater than the very own university to whom it belongs demonstrates just how flawed the game has become. The business-oriented mindset is the root of the problem. Ever since the game began to dominate the college sports landscape in the 1980s, college football programs have lost sight of moral obligations and have taken any strides necessary to win. Programs of highly regarded universities became willing to break NCAA rules when recruiting athletes. Although the boosters are responsible for providing the players the impermissible benefits, many high-ranking school officials, presidents, coaches, and athletic directors overlook the issue. As one sports columnist put it, quote, Recruiting is an unsavory game of broken promises and double reverses. It is about grown men trying to sell teenagers to tomorrow, although what either side says might not be true by tonight. End quote. One of the most notable recruitment scandals in history took place at Southern Methodist University. In 1985, college football's best-ranked team was accused of offering 13 players a total of $47,000.
What began as a simple $100 donation to a player quickly turned into one of the sport's greatest cheating scandals. Ultimately, in 1987, SMU was given the unthinkable. The NCAA had enforced the death penalty, banning the program from any participation of a football activity for two seasons. Since that unprecedented decision, the program has remained virtually winless each season. Very little has changed in terms of the poor ethics displayed by programs from the 1980s to today. Although there has been a myriad of recent scandals, such as the violations committed by the Ohio State University, the University of North Carolina, the University of Southern California, and Temple University, the recent scandal involving the once prominent University of Miami football program has most resembled the downfall of the SMU program. According to ESPN.com, in 2011, the NCAA suspended eight University of Miami football players for their involvement in receiving illegal cash incentives to, pay, to play for the university. Then, on February 26, 2013, former Miami coach Clint Hurt was alleged to have known about the distribution of improper benefits to three players in the form of meals, cash, and entertainment services, which is a violation of NCAA Rule Number 10.1. In response to the issue, NCAA President Mark Emmert proclaimed, quote, The conduct of the University of Miami is an illustration of the need for serious fundamental change in many critical aspects of college sports, end quote. The mastermind behind the Miami scandal was longtime booster Nevin Shapiro, who, off who after his arrest claims to have offered players access to sex parties, yachts, and even paid for the abortion of an impregnated girl who had sex with a Miami player. Furthermore, in 2007, notorious as an illegal recruiter, Willie Lyles informed Texas A&M University, among other prestigious universities uh, and football powerhouses, that if they wanted to, to sign coveted recruit Patrick Peterson, they would need to pay up to $80,000 for his services. Evidently, coaches and members close to the program are willing to cover up illegal activity and take any steps necessary to win even if that requires cheating to enhance the, the talent at the school and specifically the football team. However, it's quite hypocritical that this president who once claimed that the football programs result in the success of the university is now calling for monumental changes. It's great that he's calling for these changes, but what in fact has he done? Sanctioning a program without impacting the coach and only impacting the program is not going to change anything. If anything, the University of Miami committed more infractions than the SMU program in 1985. However, Emmert would never impose the death penalty on the University of Miami, knowing the impact it could have on the revenue that the NCAA and college football generates from these games. Further proving the impact of money on this game, in 2007, notorious as an illegal recruiter, Willie Lyles informed Texas A&M University, among other prestigious football powerhouses, that if they wanted to sign coveted recruit Patrick Peterson, who ultimately wound up playing for the Louisiana State University, they would need to pay $80,000 for his services. Surely LSU jumped on that, but yet no accusations have been made about this, even with the recruiter saying that we had to pay $80,000 for his services. Because LSU is such a powerhouse, the NCAA would not want to interfere with that and ultimately lose money if LSU indeed is penalized. Evidently, coaches and members close to the programs are willing to cover up illegal activity and take any steps necessary to win, even if that requires cheating to enhance the, talents, to enhance the talent on a school's football team. With everything revolving around money and the business-driven mindset, it's completely ruptured the purity of the game and ruined what we call college football. So in terms of uh, the purity of the game, in regards specifically to college football, do you feel that it's lost sort of the, the focus of what it was built upon and now become more of an industry where all the NCAA cares about is how much revenue they're going to bring in, all the programs care about is their revenue, uh, especially with, I know Maryland said that they realigned to the Big Ten because they thought it would help their TV ratings and, oh, and obviously attendance for games uh, with regards to just football. Right. So do you feel that it, it's becoming too big of a problem? 
So, so you actually have a couple questions in there because you're talking about purity of the sport, of any sport, and then you're talking about revenue, mm -hmm. and then you're talking about what drives a university to go into what division or what conference. And, um, and certainly revenue does drive which conference they can go into. You know, years ago it was, what conference can we compete in? Because yeah. competition was the, was, was the focus. Now all the conferences have their own TV networks. Correct. Yeah. So, so now, in, instead of being, okay, where could we compete, it's where can we generate the most money, and then that money now will give us the players that we because can Because you, you know Rutgers isn't going to compete for, the, for three, maybe even five years while they're in the Absolutely. Big Ten. Absolutely. Absolutely, the they're not. They're, yeah. you know, um, um, but their, their thought is like what I just said. Right. Let's get here so that we can get the money and then get the players to compete. Um, and I think years ago it was the opposite direction. And so to sit here and say which one is right and which one is wrong, it's, it's what it is. And, and that's where it's going. Um, whether we agree with it or not, you, you still have to go with it or else you're going to be left behind. And you're, you're not going to be competing or getting money. So in order to compete sometimes, now you have to have the revenue. And when we talk about purity of sport, it was always the other way around. Yeah. It was the higher competitive teams, the, the teams that won, like the Notre Dames, you know, that they brought in the revenue because they were just yeah. so good. And now, it's not, it's not. You need the revenue. So why do, you think, why do you think it's changed? Why, what do you think has... Society. Society has changed. I'm at the, I don't see it, but um, you know, it, it's a, it, because athletics are such a business. Two colleges, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it's unfortunate that you have situations like that, but yeah. I, but, but it, it becomes a business. I have a lot to say about that, but the one word I could say about it is. Um, There's too much than one word. I'm not a big fan of the just NCAAs pick one and, and how they treat <laughs> the athletes, it, yeah. that's for certain. Um, I, I think that if I am going to pick a word, I think that it might be greed. Some of the inhumane steps that programs are willing to take to win ultimately come down to the expense of players' health and safety. Many programs as of late have been under scrutiny for how hard they work their athletes. For instance, in 2008, Michigan, Ball State, San Diego State, and Texas State were all accused of exceeding the maximum number of hours for practice per week, which is 20 hours constituted by the NCAA. Dennis Dodds has nicknamed the months of January through August as the kill season, primarily because that's when players have worked out the hard hardest and at the most risk. Arguably the worst example of overworking players occurred at the University of Iowa, another big name football college. Thirteen Iowa players were taken to the hospital in 2011 during summer workouts after diagnosed with external muscle fatigue. Then, to add to the horrific event, while his players were in the hospital, Kirk Ferentz continued to recruit numerous prospects, ignoring the well-being of his ill players. During the offseason, players go through workouts by militaristic strength and conditioning coaches who put them through brutal workouts. Coaches are too consumed by the necessity to win that they will put the health of their college students at risk. It is quite despicable to know that winning comes ahead of the health of the student-athletes. Dating back to 2001, there has been a registered total of 21 college football players' deaths and 19 of them directly occurring from an off-season workout from overtraining. Whether intentional or not, recent incidents regarding coaches overworking athletes beyond healthy limits suggest there needs to be a change in the attitudes in the game. The clock. Northwestern does not want to chance that. Coulter is going to run and he's got a crease. Coulter, he's got a touchdown if he stays on his feet. Six for the Wildcats. What is being called a big win for college athletes. A national labor relations official ruled Wednesday that football players at Northwestern University are employees of the school and can form a union. Just a few months ago, the Northwestern football team won their right to unionize from the Chicago Labor Relations Board. This unionization for them is huge because it gives them the chance to have a seat at the table and bargain for the rules and the rights that the NCAA institutes upon them. 
by being able to unionize, they can now have a say in what rules directly impact them, one of which being medical coverage. As first reported by ESPN's Outside the Lines, a petition on behalf of Northwestern University football players was filed today with the National Labor Relations Board's regional office in Chicago. One of the reasons why college football has not drawn as much attention from its medical coverage aspect as the NFL is because the NFL has multiple studies linked to former players that link playing time to long-term injuries such as brain damage. There's been no studies conducted for college players, which makes it hard for them to build up a legitimate lawsuit against the NCAA and furthermore get the public involved and make them aware of what's really going on with the situation. I think the big, in the big picture, this says a couple of things. One, for the first time, really, an independent voice has said, look, college athletics at Northwestern, meaning at major college football around the country, is a full-time job, that these athletes are, are uh, athletes first and their students second. Um, it's about just basic protections that we're not receiving right now uh, as, far as, medical, as far as medical protections. Um, if you look right now, the NCAA does not guarantee that any of our medical expenses will be covered while we're playing there, and, and definitely not after our eligibility has, have, has expired. You know, if I blow out my, my knee today and I need a knee replacement down the line and I got hurt wearing, you know, school colors, you know, the, the school isn't going to cover me. You know, I'm going to be left on my own, and, and for us, that's not fair. On top of athletes not receiving medical coverage and possibly being stuck in a worse situation after a career-ending injury, they can lose their scholarships too, just based on the fact that they cannot play anymore. There have been numerous examples of people who've gone to schools on scholarships, had a terrible injury, lose their scholarship, and back at home in debt and have no money to pay for it. Football generates more money for every university at any level than any other single sport. Mm. So if football is bringing in millions, yeah. in some cases even a billion, mm -hmm. um, I think that some of that money should, should get spread, spread out to the student athletes. Um, you know, I, I'm totally against the argument that, well, they're getting free college. Um, that doesn't count. Mm -hmm. that, that's not a paycheck. That doesn't mean that they can take free college and get lunch. I mean, it, it, that doesn't... The issue that I found is the medical coverage. You know, players, in particular with loss of scholarships and, you know, unpayable bills that kids get stuck with. Absolutely. So what... Do you think there's any argument that, uh, especially a Division One university or college, can make that they shouldn't have health insurance for the players? No, they should have health insurance for the player for the entire four years. That should be... A, a, a no-brainer, so to speak. Um, they should absolutely. Uh, that's that's a basic essential. You're there to play ball, and and you get hurt playing ball. Um, it should be the university's responsibility, and that should be at any division. To be quite mm -hmm. honest with you, yeah. um, I could see an argument for it if you get injured and it's not during their supervision. Mm -hmm. um, you know, then I can see an argument for it. But if it's, you know, while you're playing that sport that you were uh, recruited for, then you should get coverage. Another reason why medical coverage has become such a big issue is because the NCAA, nor do the conferences, provide any type of mandate that requires schools to provide medical insurance or any type of trust fund for players to rely on if they have that type of injury. It completely goes down to the school's responsibility and how they feel the players are worth to them. Not only is it a moral problem, but it's a financial problem that schools should feel the pressure to have to support the people who are working so hard to make money for them and making their institution as powerful as it is. While there are many examples of schools who do do a great job of providing their players with insurance to help out with these type of injuries, there are way too many schools that turn a blind eye and don't help the players at all. One of the biggest examples is Auburn University, a school that won the national championship game over three years ago and returned to it this year. Since 2005-2006 season to current times, Auburn has increased coaches' salaries by 93%, compared to only increasing medical coverage by only 14%. 
Auburn is considered one of the biggest college football programs and make millions every year off its players. You would think a school that prides so much on their football team would provide a little more care to the people who are making it all possible. There are also examples of personal stories of players who have been affected by the negligence of the school's lack of paying for medical coverage. A former Ohio University football player was temporarily paralyzed while at school during a workout, and the day after, the athletic office rejected any responsibility of his bills. In the 1970s, TCU running back Kent Waldrop was paralyzed with a broken neck during a game. Several months later, TCU informed him they were not liable for any per- payment of injury. Their biggest argument was that they claimed he got hurt in extracurricular activity and that he was a student first. But how was he first made aware of the school? Through an athletic coach. So why are these players called student-athletes when the only reason they're made aware of the schools are from athletics, but once they're there, they're considered students first and everything else is supposed to just fall by the wayside? One of the main arguments that universities have used to not provide insurance for these players is not only are they students first, but also the fact that it will cost too much money. However, Middlebury College, a small Division three school in Vermont, provides insurance not only for its football players, but for every athlete. So what does that say about the big universities? That it's not about the money, it's just the fact that they can't stand to see some of the money that they're making from these players can actually help to go back into their pockets and not have them stuck with insane bills. The reason why none of these changes have occurred since the NCAA was implemented in the early 1900s is because the amount of power they rule over the players. Players under the NCAA lose their basic rights to due process. All decisions on their eligibility and any allegations go through people in the NCAA many times without hearings and don't hear the other side of it. The convicted felons in our current court system have more rights than an average football player suffering an allegation. They rarely have their voice heard and don't get to choose between any, the rulings. They can't appeal, and many times the process is just wrong. What do you think um, about players not being allowed to, like, you know, what happened with Johnny Menzel, not being allowed yeah. to sign autographs and sell, yeah, sell something with your name on it? That's absolutely ridiculous. That's your property. Yeah, but- it violates your constitutional rights. To yeah, yeah. I, you know, sure. It violates your yeah. constitutional rights. Um, you know, the fact that you can't sell something that you manufacture or that you make, like your signature, mm-hmm. I think is just ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And what's uh, worse about it is that they exploit it. Instead of not letting you do it, they take advantage of it. So. Correct. Yeah. They want this greed. Yeah. Isn't that the, that's the biggest so, greed right there. Yeah. yeah. You know, when you think about that. You know, with college, you, you're definitely playing on a level uh, in football in any of the contact sports at the college level where the, that's something that you know, has to be looked into, has to be... Um, Not only do players lose their basic rights to due process, but the NCAA takes another privilege away from them. Since they're not even being paid, Players' only way to earn money is to work a job, but the NCAA really takes that right away from them too. Players who are on scholarship don't even have the ability to work a part-time job, therefore having absolutely no way to make money. However, they're treated differently than other citizens and even other college students. Other students can earn merit in spending money and make money from positions at the school. The student body president at Kentucky earned $5,000 last year just for holding that position. If any athlete had gotten that money, it would be a major NCAA violation, and who knows what would happen to the school and the player. While the NCAA takes any opportunity for the players to make money for themselves, they also find their own way to market the players without any rights, through video games, t-shirts, and other markets. Players can't even sign autographs without getting in trouble. For people who want to pay them for their name, players lose that right. There have been multiple allegations that have came in the past years over players simply just signing autographs, selling merchandise that belongs to them, and they get in trouble for it, and the schools and the players are punished by it through suspensions. One of the most recent and popular allegations in history was Johnny Menzel this past summer. The former Texas A&M quarterback and Heisman Trophy winner, who's now in the NFL, signed autographs and memorabilia and made money off them. 
The NCAA was considering suspending him for the whole season, but a large amount of public outrage was troubled over the fact that someone could lose their right to play by trying to market their own name for pressure on the NCAA, and therefore only suspended him for one half of the first game of the season. This shows that the NCAA does have a lot of power, but when the public's made aware of these ridiculous rules, things can be changed. Paying players, or at least allowing them to market their own name, would stop a lot of census allegations from the past. Two instances regarding Boise State have came up recently. A current wide receiver named Geraldo Baldwin was forced to miss four games this past season because he borrowed a 1990 Toyota Camry that had over 170,000 miles on it. Not only was he suspended for those first four games, but he was required to pay a charity of over $700 for his violation. Also, a current Boise State recruit who has been homeless for many years of his life could not be helped right away by boosters because of fear of possible NCAA sanctions. They had to wait about a week before the NCAA allowed the boosters to pay for the kid to have a place to live. I think there's definitely a problem wrong with the NCAA when you can't see a homeless kid and you can't help him out right away. First, you have to check to make sure there's no sanctions that will be brought up on your school first. This, this is an example of how football can really help a kid, but what does, good does it do when the NCAA has all these rules that barely make it possible? Another example of the power the NCAA holds over the players is scholarships. While many people think scholarships are great ways for young people to get a good education, they're often abused. Scholarships, contrary to popular belief, are only one-year deals, and they're redeemed solely by athletic performance, usually by judgment of the coach. That means if you're a 4-0 student, get great grades, but you're not the best football player, you could find yourself, if you can't afford the school, back at home the next year, while someone who has a 2.3 GPA barely eligible, but he's a star player and like an NFL prospect, could end up being having a renewed scholarship. Now, who really deserves to be in that school more? Also with scholarships and eligibility and getting an education, by not allowing players to market themselves like Johnny Manziel, he had two years of eligibility left at college. But you basically force someone to leave when they have such a chance to make millions of dollars like that, when you're not even allowing them to make a cent off their own name. If you want the game of college football to really be great and keep people around for a long time, you'll allow players to live like normal students, to make money off their name, to endorse and market themselves, and not have these crazy rules because just because you're the NCAA. Many players, while they're considered student-athletes, know their value to the school is more important as a football player than being an honor roll student. An anonymous player at Tennessee said it was more important for the school that I get straight C's, barely stay eligible, and get an interception in the, next, in the next game, as opposed to straight A's and barely seeing the field. This just goes to show that the players know that they're there for football, that they're there for the school to play, and that what they do in the classroom is not reflected and won't be as great for the school as if they become star players and rise up the popularity of the school. As for the player's side, they feel that they should get paid because of how much work they put in. On average, they work three more hours of a work week than an average American worker does. Also, a startling number that was conducted by the NCAA and Drexel University comprised that an average Division I football player's fair market value is $178,000. Now, if a player goes to school for four years, earns a bachelor's degree, and finds a job right out of college, which is a big if, the average bachelor's degree will get you about a forty dollars to $60,000 job. Now, if the average fair market value for the player is $178,000, but he's going to school for free, and in the best case scenario, he'll leave with a job around $60,000. On top of the fact that players are grossly undervalued in terms of just cash, there has also been a direct correlation from a football team's success to increase in admission. Boise State and Boston College have both experienced big boosts in admissions after successful seasons. In Boise State's case, over the last 10 years, their admissions have increased by 24%. And what's the biggest change to the university? They have a national championship competing team generally every year out of the last 10 years. Boston College, after Doug Flutie won the Heisman Trophy, their average SAT score for admitted students went up 100 points, and their admissions rose as well. So, 
you can call it a coincidence, but obviously a football team's popularity brings more people drawn and attracted to the school. And when more people are drawn and attracted, it makes the school more competitive and overall a better school. Players also rarely make it to the NFL. Over 90% of the players who play in college don't make it to the NFL. While well, many people use that as a reason why they shouldn't be played, I think that's a determining reason why they should be paid or at least have the chance to make money for their talents. If you're not going to go to the NFL, then while you're in college should be the time you can really market yourself and make money while you can. If you end up going to the NFL, that's great. You're going to make millions of dollars. But for the players who don't get that chance, they should have the real opportunity to make money when they can and not be stricken by the NCAA's rules. The dictatorship. However, instead of standing by the point that players should be represented and paid for their true talents, the NCAA has considered them amateurs solely because they don't get paid. However, as an amateur of someone who draws millions of viewers constantly every week, the BCS Championship game had over 26 million viewers this year. Now, I would not consider an amateur player someone who draws attention from that big of a market. If they're truly amateurs, then they'd be playing in front of tens or hundreds of crowds. But people who draw millions, it makes simply no sense to consider them amateurs. The NCAA also uses the argument that they shouldn't get paid because they're students first. However, how true is that? They miss classes, change schedules, and they make many trips to avoid classes for games. Now. A player can change the schedule around to mispractice, but what if the player wants to mispractice for a game? Odds are that player is not going to play and they could lose their scholarship for, God forbid, trying to put their education ahead of their football career. Before the corruption of the NCAA, it was actually commonplace for players to get paid. In 1939, the University of Pittsburgh football team, the underclassmen actually boycotted because the upperclassmen were getting paid more than them. So what changed between the NCAA? Obviously, it was the people running it who wanted to see change of rules to make sure that the players couldn't get paid and all money was going through them and they can decide where it goes. Also, the student-athlete was put in by the former NCAA head, Walter Byers. So many schools are being terrified that they would have to pay workers' compensation to these players that they use the term student-athlete to make sure that they were considered students first and that many people who had these catastrophic injuries would not have to be uh, paid from the schools. Many people have compared this issue to Olympians many years ago. Before the 1970s, Olympians were not allowed to market their names and make money from their accomplishments. However, that all changed when one thing happened. They had a seat at the table and were allowed to bargain with the Olympic committees. After this happened, they earned the right to market themselves. Just to give an example, if Michael Phelps existed before they were allowed to market their names, we would all know about him, but he wouldn't have the millions of dollars that he has today. The, the Olympics, they don't have to pay the athletes. The athletes are making the money on their own because of their fame. Now, what, how different is that from the NCAA allowing the players to make money for their fame? The biggest reason changes can't occur is because players simply don't have the voice that they, that they need to get the NCAA to listen. Former UCLA running back and current Green Bay Packers running back, Jonathan Franklin, put the system in the best words. He said, we have a full work day, and the university sees the benefits of our work. That's exactly how the system goes. Isn't the reason the University of North Carolina exists, isn't the reason it was founded to educate students? Shouldn't sports be on the sidelines? You, you don't have to convince me of that. <laughs> uh. Jim Tressel has resigned at Ohio State amid the controversy over players selling memorabilia and Trestle's subsequent lying to NCAA investigators about those transgressions.
Mark May What's now, going? our Hall of Famer, and, and May Day, some severe allegations made against the University of Miami in the Yahoo article. A lot to take in 20 minutes into the program here. What were your thoughts when you read the, read the article? Well, surprised, Ryan, but not shocked. Not shocked because it's almost every week that another team breaks some of the NCAA rules, and we're talking about it each and every week. But I do know this, I do know that there's a due process that you're entitled to, and I want to see that process come forth, and it's not the court of public opinion. And so, we all have our own opinions. I have some really strong opinions, I shared them with you this morning. And, and to be honest with you, and you can probably hear it, and I, and I apologize to you, I get mad. And it's, uh... Pretty disturbing. Just it makes you sick to see that this could happen uh, to this level.